Good afternoon. Let me extend a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today. I'm delighted to see so many of our students, faculty, staff, alumni, supporters, and Dean's Council members. I'm also thrilled to welcome all of our colleagues in, public, in the public health community, and particularly our virtual audience, especially other schools of public health across the country who are watching this via live webcast. I'm honored to welcome Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius, Senator Tom Daschle, and Harvard University faculty member Sheila Burke as our guest speakers. I would also like to welcome our esteemed panelists who will be sharing their knowledge and insights as we begin to tackle the enormous issues surrounding the historic Supreme Court health care ruling. In particular, however, I'm grateful to Professor Sarah Rosenbaum, Health Policy Department Chair Paula Lance, and University Trustee Peter Kovler for conceiving this exciting event. It would not have been possible without the support of Peter and Judy Kovler and the Kovler Foundation, so thank you everyone so much. As the Public Health School Dean, I'm pleased and gratified that the Supreme Court ruling came down in support of the Affordable Care Act. This ruling means that millions of uninsured Americans will now have access to much needed health care services. But this critical moment in our nation's valiant struggle to provide health care to all brings a new and complex set of challenges, setting up insurance exchanges, addressing health care provider shortages, quality and cost of care issues, and the list goes on. So even though this is a turning point to be celebrated, there is much more to do. How well the ACA is implemented will in the end determine the ultimate success or failure in recognizing universal coverage. The GW School of Public Health and Health Services can, can, intends to continue addressing these complicated issues. Workable solutions must be constructed and implemented. The nation's uninsured have waited too long. I expect and hope today's forum will be the first of many such events. To that end, I am deeply grateful for the support of George Washington University President Stephen Knapp, who is committed to the vision and mission of the School of Public Health and Health Services. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Knapp. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dean Goldman, and it really is a delight to join the Dean in welcoming everyone, including our broadcast as well as virtual audiences, to this afternoon's very timely discussion. I'd like to give special thanks to George Washington Trustee Peter Kovler, Judy Kovler, and the Kovler Foundation, whose generosity has made this event possible. We're very fortunate to have assembled an extraordinary group of speakers and panelists to address the implications of the Supreme Court's historic June 28th ruling on the Affordable Care Act. They're here to explore the effects of this landmark decision on everyone from patients to health care providers, insurers, and state governments. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our keynote speakers, the Honorable Kathleen Sibelius, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, former uh, Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, and Sheila Burke, a senior policy advisor who serves as a faculty research fellow at Harvard's Malcolm Wiener Center, uh, for social policy, as well as a faculty member at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and also to the distinguished panelists whose discussion will follow our keynote speakers. I'm pleased to acknowledge the faculty members, the students, and members of the Dean's Council of the School of Public Health and Health Services who are here today. Thank you all for joining us, and now it's my pleasure to turn the program back over to Dean Goldman. Thank you. Please enjoy the discussion and the panels. Thank you. Thank you, President Knapp. Now I would like to introduce our first honored speaker, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Secretary Sebelius was sworn in as the 21st Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services on April 28, 2009. Since taking office, Secretary Sebelius has led ambitious efforts to improve America's health. As part of the historic Affordable Care Act, Secretary Sebelius is implementing reforms that end many of the insurance industry's worst abuses and will help 34 million uninsured Americans get health coverage. Under the law, she is also carrying out policies that put a new focus on wellness and prevention um, to, so that support the adoption of electronic medical records and help recruit and train more primary care providers. In addition, Secretary Sebelius is working closely with doctors, nurses, hospital leaders, employers, and patients to slow the growth of health care costs through better care and better health. 
In 2011, Forbes named Secretary Sebelius as the 13th most powerful woman in the world. She served as governor of Kansas from 2003 until her cabinet appointment and was named one of America's top five governors by Time magazine. Secretary Sebelius is the first daughter of a governor to be elected governor in American history. Her father, John Gilligan, served as Ohio's governor from 1971 to 1975. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Sebelius. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be back at George Washington. I was telling Dean Goldman that I have had the pleasure of being here at the School of Public Health a number of times and announcing a number of important new initiatives here in this auditorium. And I think there's um, it's a perfect venue to discuss um, the Affordable Care Act and the importance of the Supreme Court decision. I want to recognize um, President Steve Knapp and thank him for his hospitality, certainly Dean Goldman um, for her not only warm welcome, but her leadership here at the school. Um, you're going to have a great treat. Uh, some colleagues who I've worked with for a long time are members of the panel um, that you're going to hear from, and certainly the other keynote speakers. Um, but I'll tell you a little something about them that might not be immediately obvious. We all have Kansas connections. Um, I am a former governor, former insurance commissioner, um, live in Kansas. My husband is a federal judge still in Kansas. Tom Daschle married a Kansan, had the good sense to do what I did, marry a Kansan. And Sheila Burke, a uh, long-time um, aide and assistant uh, to Senator Bob Dole, the Senate Majority Leader from Kansas. So you might have thought we were here for our health care expertise, but it's really our Kansas connections. Um, you know, over the last couple of weeks, there has been a lot of commentary about what the Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act means for politicians in Washington. Uh, we've heard speculation about who's a winner and who's a loser, who's up and who's down, what it means for November. And with congressional Republicans um, today holding their 31st vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act, it's clear that some want the political discussion and the political battle to keep going. But I'm really glad to have a chance to be with you today to talk about what the health care law means for those outside of Washington. Uh, the hardworking families that the law was really designed to help. Uh, but to do that, we need to set the stage a little and remember where this country was when this law was passed two years ago. So back in 2010, the urgency around health care challenges was growing, related both to the health care of our nation and also the economy of the country. Uh, despite spending more than any nation on earth, we were moving toward 50 million uninsured citizens and really mediocre health results. Our health expenditures were consuming an increasingly greater share of our GDP, threatening our global competitiveness. Families, businesses, and governments were all struggling under the burden of rising costs. And between 2000 and 2009, the decade before the health bill was passed, Insurance premiums doubled. The share of small business owners offering employee coverage dropped from 70%, where it was in 2002, under 60%, leaving more and more of those employees uninsured. And Medicare costs continued to rise, putting the trust fund on pace to be insolvent by 2016. Uh, one small business owner who wrote to me early in my term summed up the frustration that so many Americans were feeling when he wrote to me, I'm near the breaking point. With guaranteed annual increases at 10 to 15 times the rate of inflation, eventually we'll go out of business or be forced to cancel our employees' insurance. Either way, it's a lousy set of options. At the same time, the private health market was becoming more consolidated and less competitive. 
Now, some Americans had dependable access to coverage in public plans. More children, the seniors, disabled, veterans, even the poorest adults and pregnant women through Medicaid. And employees of the largest companies usually fared pretty well. But that still left a lot of hardworking families in a broken market where insurance companies made a lot of the rules. Totally legally, insurers could cap your coverage, raise your rates, or cancel the coverage with very little accountability, particularly if you were in the small group or individual market. And if you were one of the 129 million Americans with a pre-existing condition like cancer or even asthma, you could be locked out or priced out of the market altogether. Now, that was a fairly successful business model for many insurance companies. In fact, in 2009, the five largest insurers made $12 billion in profit. But that didn't work very well for a lot of the people who were left on the sidelines. So the health care law was passed in large part to address the twin issues of cost and coverage, and that's exactly what has begun to happen over the last two years. So the law's first principle is pretty simple. If you have coverage, you can keep it. For the 250 million Americans with insurance today, the main change in a lot of those policies is that they'll get some more security. The law puts in place new insurance rules, and many of those are already in place, prohibiting insurers from capping the coverage or canceling it without cause if someone gets sick. Preventive care is now free for 54 million Americans with private plans. And there are new limits on how much of your premium insurance companies can spend on overhead costs like CEO bonuses and marketing ads. And as a result, starting this summer, about 13 million Americans will get rebates from their insurance companies. You heard me correctly. Insurance companies are actually sending money back to their customers, thanks to the 80-20 rule. Now, despite what some have claimed, the Affordable Care Act does not cut Medicare benefits. In fact, the program is more robust than ever. New benefits have been added for seniors. The law has begun to close the insurance gap in Medicare prescription drug plans, the so-called donut hole, saving over 5 million beneficiaries with the highest medication costs, about $600 a piece. We have brand new efforts and new surveillance tools in fraud and abuse areas, and we've already returned in the last two years about $5.4 billion to the trust fund. And that doesn't include the new $3 billion settlement that was just announced last week. Yesterday, our department announced that so far in 2012, more than 16 million seniors and persons with disability on Medicare have already taken advantage this year of at least one free preventive service, like a wellness visit or a cancer screening. Now, what we know also is that small business owners were often at a very difficult place in the market. They are beginning to see some relief, thanks to the new tax credit that covers up to about a third of their insurance bills for employees. And all Americans with insurance will benefit from no longer having to pay the extra $1,000 per family that's estimated to cover the cost of uncompensated care for Americans with no coverage. The law is beginning to provide some better coverage choices for middle class families. We have about 3.1 million young adults, some of them might be here at GW, who were previously uninsured prior to 2010 and now have coverage on their parents' plans. We got 70,000 Americans all around the country who are taking part in the new high-risk pools that were previously locked totally out of the insurance market because of their pre-existing health conditions. At the same time, the Affordable Care Act has begun breaking the stalemate in Washington on addressing health care costs. Now, there was a lot of agreement for decades that our health care costs were too high and that they were continuing to rise in an unabated fashion. But while there was a lot of agreement that we had to do something about high costs, there wasn't a lot of action in Congress, certainly much action prior to the law passing. 
in the ideas put forward by those who favor repeal would limit government health spending, lower government health costs, simply by shifting costs to seniors and patients. But there's an alternative vision of how to lower costs that's part of the construct of the Affordable Care Act. And it really captures doing on a national scale what some of the best health systems have begun to do around the country. And that's bringing down costs by actually improving care. So prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, many of the financial incentives in our two large public programs, and Medicare and Medicaid right now, include about a third of the country. Almost 100 million people are participants in one of those two programs, or sometimes in both. But the financial incentives were often in the wrong place. They actually, many times, penalize care improvements, um, the way we paid providers and hospitals. So over the last two years, we've really begun to change the incentives in the healthcare system to reward providers for improving care. And we've had an enormously enthusiastic response from doctors and hospitals across the country. For example, just on Monday, we announced that a total of 154 health organizations serving 2.5 million Americans have already signed up under the law to form the so-called accountable care organizations. Now, these are structures where providers share the savings when their patients stay healthy. And it's a huge first step in a voluntary program around new care delivery strategies. So there are many more of those strategies underway, lowering hospital-based infections, looking at ways we can improve protocol, medical health homes, bundling care, all designed to really keep people healthy in the first place, keep them out of the hospital, and lower the opportunities for return. All of that progress has been going on in the last two years. So when we have, as we have again today, people talking about repealing the law, I think it's important to remember what's really at stake. This has nothing to do with the fortunes of elected politicians around Washington, all of whom, by the way, already have excellent health care. It's the health and economic security of middle class families around America that are really at stake. So repeal actually could subject those families once again to some of the worst insurance abuses. We know it would automatically raise the price of seniors' medications and add financial barriers to their preventive care. It would end the tax credits that are currently helping small business cover their employees and force millions of young adults to once again begin their careers without the security of health coverage. And it would mean that too often the best quality of care would continue to be out of reach for most Americans. What we know is that the Supreme Court decision, there were four justices who actually voted to strike down the entire law, would have accomplished those goals. But the majority of justices has allowed us to move ahead on full implementation of the act. And with the slight change in Medicaid, which now makes the program a voluntary program and removes the penalty phase of Medicaid so that the Department of Health and Human Services could not um, take all of uh, the underlying Medicaid funding away from a state who chose not to participate. Medicaid expansion will operate very much like the CHIP expansion has operated over the past number of years, where states voluntarily come into the program, and we think that given the very generous framework of state-federal participation and the opportunity to ensure the largest number of lower-income adults in that program, that states will indeed decide to ensure their populations. Now, most of you know that two major parts of the program don't take effect until 2014. The new marketplaces uh, will be set up in every state where families and small business owners actually get to make, for the first time ever, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of health plans and choose the one that's right for them. There will be new rules for insurance companies. No one could be discriminated against because of a pre-existing health condition. And you can't be charged more because of your gender 
in an insurance plan. Now, farm families, small business owners, entrepreneurs, and others who can't afford coverage can qualify for a tax credit averaging about $4,000 per family. And members of Congress and their families will get coverage through these same exchanges alongside their constituents. So over the past two years, we've been working on implementation because setting up these new markets can't happen overnight. And we've partnered closely with states to set up the new consumer-friendly marketplaces. And far from what's reported as a federal takeover, the law really gives states maximum flexibility in shaping their own markets. States can decide, for instance, to fully operate their marketplace, to partner with HHS to run pieces of the exchange, or to have us do it all. In fact, the law contains a provision that if states come up with their own way of covering the same number of people with the same kind of quality and no cost increase, they can present a plan and take over the whole system. The president has actually asked Congress to move up that provision from 2017, the way it's written in the law, to 2014, so states could have the flexibility in year one. And yesterday I received letters from 12 governors say they are already fully engaged in planning to establish their own marketplaces. We anticipate more to be fully ready as we move through 2012. But in the months to come, we'll keep working with states to meet them where they think it's appropriate and have all the exchanges running in every state by 2014. Another key change that is coming in 2014 is that states will begin receiving a very generous federal match to expand Medicaid coverage to uninsured adults at 133% of poverty. Now, those of you who don't walk around with the poverty tables in your head, that means that for an individual, you make less than $15,000 a year. And for a family of four, the income is less than $31,000 a year. So we're really talking about some of the poorest working families in this country. Now, here's what states are being offered. For the first three years, 14, 15, and 16, the federal government pays 100% of the newly insured enrollees, as well as paying health care providers who serve Medicaid patients at a higher rate. After 2017, the federal government's share is reduced, but never less than 90%. So the lowest it gets at the end of 10 years is a 90-10 share, a much more generous match than the current 57% that the federal government pays for Medicaid programs today. The states also have flexibility in setting the benefits for the newly covered folks. And their expenditures will be offset by reduced spending on uncompensated care for the uninsured and other savings in the law. So this has unprecedented federal support, access to affordable coverage for low-income residents, and steep reductions in costs for the state, the citizens, and the health care provider. And we think at the end of the day, this is a deal that states won't want to turn down. As I said earlier, we've been through this before with the CHIP program. When Congress expanded coverage for kids in 1997 and offered to pay 70% of the cost, not 100% of the cost, states were initially skeptical. Only eight states began, coverage el- began covering eligible children in the first year. But within two and a half years, all 50 states had decided that the benefits far outweighed the costs and committed to participating. The 2014 Medicaid expansion offers states an even better deal. And we're hopeful that states will take advantage of it to cover their neediest working families and ensure that their doctors and their hospitals actually get paid. So earlier today, I sent a letter to all governors, many of them my former colleagues, laying out this information. We're going to keep working closely with states to make sure that the hardworking families who are looking forward to this new day have access to affordable coverage. Now that the Supreme Court has issued their decision, I'm hopeful we can stop refighting the old political battles and trying to take away benefits that millions of Americans are already enjoying. Instead, 
to move forward with implementing and improving the law to provide more security to Americans who have insurance, more choices for those who don't, and lower costs for everyone. Thank you all very much, and I'm going to turn the podium back over to Dean Goldman. Thank you so much, Secretary Sebelius, for your remarks and your thoughtful leadership. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of the country's most respected former senators, Senator Tom Daschle. Senator Daschle has participated in the development and the debate of almost every major public policy issue of the last three decades. He has crossed party lines throughout his extensive career in public service, working with both Democrats and Republicans to make the differ a difference in the lives of millions of Americans. From health care reform to addressing poverty relief in the developing world, Senator Daschle has been an influential voice in American politics. He continues to remain an influential force. In 2007, he joined with former majority leaders George Mitchell, Bob Dole, and Howard Baker to form the Bipartisan Policy Center, an organization dedicated to finding common ground on some of the pressing pol public policy issues of our time. Today, he is a senior policy advisor to the law firm DLA Piper, where he serves as a strategic advisor on public policy issues. Please join me in welcoming Senator Tom Daschle. Thank you very much, Dean Goldman, President Knapp, distinguished members of the faculty administration of GW, and all of our guests. I can't tell you how pleased and flattered I am to share the dais with Secretary Sebelius and Sheila Burke, two people who know this issue as well as anybody in the country. So I'm very appreciative of this uh, extraordinary time and this moment, and to have the opportunity to share our thoughts with you. I uh, listened very carefully to Dean Goldman's introduction. I was at a school in South Dakota not long ago and introduced by a fifth grader as somebody who used to be an important public serpent. <laughs> I, these days, I'm not sure if there was a message in that introduction, but I, uh, I appreciate all of those who serve in public life. Needless to say, this is a transformational moment, equal if not exceeding in history anything our country has experienced in 200 years. So you're witnessing history in its rawest and most unpredictable form. I would start with that realization, that assertion. And before I get to what I think are the five remaining obstacles now that the Supreme Court decision has been made, I'd, I'd make some general observations that I think are relevant and may provide some context. The first observation is that the United States is the only country in the industrialized world that doesn't have a health care system. If a system is defined as having a central decision-making and administrative authority, we have none. We have a health care market made up of a collage of subsystems, both public and private, today almost 50-50. And that collage of subsystems that form the market are both a great strength and a great weakness for American health care. The second assertion or observation I would make is that while health care is such a divisive issue, there are some things for which there is very little disagreement. There is little disagreement that we have a cost problem. We talked earlier today at another forum about how serious a problem we have relating to health costs in America. You and I spend about $8,000 in taxes, premiums, and out-of-pocket expenses on health, and that's a lot, about 40% more than the second most expensive country. But I think without elaborating, I could spend all of my time just on that. I'll just put it this way. When I was born, health was 4% of GDP. When my children were born, it was 8%. I'm lucky enough to have four grandchildren. It went to 16%. And if I'm lucky enough to have great-grandchildren, the advisors tell us that it will be 32% of GDP if we do nothing. 
That is unsustainable. We have a serious access problem. Approximately 50 million people uninsured. If we do nothing, they say by 2020, just the number of uninsured will be 64 million, and there are tens of millions more, estimated around 30 million, that are underinsured. We know we have a problem. I saw a report not long ago that in the last five years, about 12,000 people in Florida died because they had no insurance, 15,000 in Texas. So there's a direct link between access and life. The third problem we have is one that we hate to acknowledge, but it's true. We have a quality problem in our country. There's very little disagreement about it. Life expectancy is going down. My grandchildren have a lower life expectancy than I do, in large measure because of diabetes, but there are other issues as well. We're virtually last in most of the factors that relate to preventable, preventable care and preventable death and morbidity and mortality. Last of the industrialized countries. So we've got a quality issue too. We also understand that there's a whole array of causes that bring about these three problems and there's very little disagreement about that either. We have virtually no transparency in the health sector. By that I mean health is about the only sector in our economy where at the time of purchase you don't know what it's going to cost or who's going to pay. There is far more data on every sports figure in America than any provider in America. We have serious problems with regard to unnecessary care, driven in part by proprietary medicine, driven in part by defensive medicine, by market-driven medicine. People see things on television they want, especially drugs, and get them from their doctor. We have a lot of reasons for the unnecessary care, but it's estimated to be perhaps as much as a third of all that we spend on health, at least a fourth. We also understand that we have very little coordination, especially among, chronic, uh, among the diseases we commonly think of as chronic diseases, chronic illness. Little coordination. Those collages of subsystems don't work with regard to chronic illness management. We have fraud and abuse, and obviously our country has never really addressed end-of-life issues. I could go on, but there's a lot of reasons why that unnecessary care continues, and it's a huge cost problem. The, 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 the other uh, significant area for which I think there is surprising agreement is when you say, okay, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, I don't think if you talk to a conservative or a liberal, a Democrat or a Republican, that you'd get much disagreement if you simply said, how about if we try to create a high performance, high value healthcare marketplace with greater access, better quality and lower cost? Nobody disagrees with that. Nobody. And so there is a significant degree of agreement in spite of the divisiveness that you hear so much about with regard to health. The real question, and it drives so much of the ideological and the political debate today, the real question is, what is the role of government? And it's on that question that there is a significant amount of ideological and political difference of opinion, a chasm. Today, the vote in the House is about the role of government in health. And that was really, at its heart, the debate about what kind of mandate we should have with regard to health insurance. You frankly cannot have a successful universal coverage model without a mandate. What most people didn't fully understand is that we already have a mandate. I call it a social mandate. It's when you go in and get care of any kind, a part of your bill has nothing to do with the care you got. It has everything to do with the care of those who don't have coverage today. That's passed on. That's man you're mandated to pay part of those who don't have health care today. That social mandate, either way, will continue until everyone someday is covered. So this mandate is not the first. We've mandated Social Security, mandated retirement through a tax. We've mandated hospital Insurance through Part A of Medicare, that's a tax. And now the Supreme Court, perhaps not surprisingly, has ruled this is really a tax. So it too is constitutional. So going forward, let me just say, I think the debate will continue about what the role of government ought to be. 
And I think it's going to play itself out, not just on the legal level, and there's going to be several more legal challenges, contraception, the subsidies for exchanges. We might see a, a court take up the case regarding the independent payment advisory boards, commonly called IPAB. There will be a lot of other legal challenges. They won't happen in the short term, but those legal challenges are still out there looming. So the legal issues have not been completely resolved by the Supreme Court's decision a couple of weeks ago. But there are four other areas for which there is going to be a significant debate. And I'll just uh, get through those. I see I'm almost out of time already, so I don't want to uh, overstay my, my time at the podium. But the first is policy. Today we saw an example of the policy debate over the role of government that's going to continue. And I don't think any of the legislative issues involving policy will get anywhere through the balance of the year. That's, that's really not uh, even much of an option, in part because Democrats control the Senate, Republicans control the House, the President is a Democrat. So the policy issues themselves are going to get a lot of political coverage and a lot of media coverage. They're not going anywhere. The policy part that will have real traction has to do with budget, because so much of the budget is health-related, Medicare and Medicaid in particular. And that will happen over the course of the year, but especially perhaps uh, in substantial ways during the lame duck session. And here, policymakers have one of two choices. We know we've got to confront health costs for the federal government uh, in the budget, in the policy realm. But they have two choices. And I was part of these choices, and I admit I failed on many occasions in making the right one. The first choice is to cut health spending and shift the costs onto states, shift them onto business, shift them onto you, shift them onto everybody outside of the federal government. Now, that, that does it. You can actually bring down federal health costs, but you actually exacerbate costs for everybody else if it's a cut and shift strategy. And I promise you, you're going to see a lot of cut and shift proposals over the course of the next couple of years. But there's a far better approach, and I don't have time right now to talk about it, but I call it redesign and improve. To actually look at health globally and find ways to deal with all those unnecessary costs and then reduce it, not just for the federal government, but globally for everybody. So the redesign and improve option is so much better but it's just not as clearly definable in that early stage. And so you're going to see a lot of, by default, a lot of members of Congress take the cut and shift approach. So policy is the first area for which the role of government is going to continue to play itself out. The second has to do with the secretary. The secretary has enormous power. I would say one of the most consequential delegations of authority in any legislation, at least in my lifetime, was through the Affordable Care Act to the Secretary in terms of defining just what we mean by creating a new health care marketplace, uh, using the goals we were talking about. She has three categories of areas within which to work. Insurance reform, she talked about that today. We're going to see a lot more insurance reform with the creation of these new marketplaces, these exchanges. We're going to see, we've already seen a lot of protections that have, for the first time, been put in place. So insurance reform is a big component of her authority, uh, but also a debate, again, about the role of government. A second is payment reform, moving away from this system that constantly rewards volume, getting to a marketplace that really puts value at the focus, at the, at the, at the center of our goal, moving away, in other words, from fee-for-service to capitated approaches for care that can really save money and provide improved quality. And the third is delivery reform, moving away from the kind of opaque process that we use today, putting a real emphasis on quality through best practices and evidence-based approaches to good medicine. All of those will play themselves out over the course of uh, the next decade at least. So that's the second area, and you're going to see a lot of debate about that. The third is not just one challenge, it's 50 challenges, and that is the challenge we find in each state. We've already seen that with governors who have announced either they're going to not participate in the exchanges or not participate in the Medicaid program, 
But as the secretary noted, when SCHIP, when the Children's Health Insurance Program started, you had only eight states that said they'd start. When we started Medicaid in 1965, only six states said they would participate. And then, of course, we moved to 50 over time. So it's not uncommon to have governors say, I don't think I'm going to go for this until they know more. And obviously, just to be fully candid and honest, uh, there is a lot of politics at play as well and ideology. But the states are really going to be the workshops. And I would dare say that all 50 states are going to take different approaches, slightly different in some cases, to sub substantially different in others. But that, too, is going to be a very big part of how this all plays out. The final realm, the final level, is political. Who ultimately gets elected president in November is going to have a whole lot to say about health care, not just for the next four years, but for the next 40. Uh, Mr. Romney has said that he would repeal it on the first day. He doesn't really have the ability to repeal all of it. Uh, he has a lot to say with how it's going to be implemented and how it's going to be funded. Uh, and so he will have... Uh, a, a, a lot of say were he to be elected. So here you have a very stark difference, and the next four months will be in part a debate about what is the role of government, and uh, as a result of our answer to that question, who should be the next president. Uh, I would say today it's about a 45-45 uh, uh, lay of the land with 10 percent undecided. Who gets six of that 10 will be the next president of the United States. The Senate is about 50-50. The House, I think Republicans have a slight edge. So it's really murky right now, and I can't really go beyond that with regard to any confidence about predictions. I will say this. I think that this country, as we face this transformational time, has to demonstrate five important qualities. First, I think it's critically important that we be resilient. Will there be setbacks and unexpected turns of events that will will uh, not be in our, uh, on our radar screen, of course. We're going to face a lot of uncertainty. But we've been resilient before, and I think we can be resilient again. Secondly, innovation. Our country is nothing if it's not innovative. We've got to continue to demonstrate the innovative spirit that we've always shown at challenging times in the past. The third is we've got to be collaborative. We can't do this alone. Partnership and persistence and pragmatism is really going to be critical. Having that collaborative attitude and spirit at all levels, the public and the private sectors, governors working with the secretary and the administration, uh, the degree to which we can collaborate is the degree to which we're going to succeed. The fourth is engagement. We all have to be engaged and, and be a part of this. We can't afford to let others make all the decisions and sit on the sidelines. We have to be engaged here, and your presence here today is an illustration of engagement. And then finally, boy, do we need leadership. We need leadership at all levels, public and private, and that ultimately will determine our success. I have many heroes. One of them is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was in a cell one day, and his cellmate kept insisting that ending apartheid in South Africa was impossible. And he kept saying that over and over. It's impossible. Mr. Mandela turned to him at one point, having heard that now several times. He said, well, many things seem impossible until they're done. Health, has seemed, health reform has seemed an impossibility for decades, if not generations. But it, too, is impossible until it's done. This is our best shot to get it done. And with leadership, I think it can be accomplished. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Daschle, for those inspiring words. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Sheila Burke. Sheila Burke served for 19 years on Capitol Hill. Early in her career, she was a member of the staff of the Senate Finance Committee responsible for legislation related to Medicare, Medicaid, and other health programs. She ultimately became Deputy Staff Director of the Finance Committee, and she went on to serve as Deputy Chief of Staff to Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole and then his Chief of Staff. In these roles, she was involved with numerous legislative issues, including those related to Medicare, Medicaid, and the maternal and child health programs, welfare reform, budget reconciliation, and the previous legislative efforts to reform health care. 
1995, she was elected as Secretary of the Senate, the Chief Administrative Officer of the United States Senate. Sheila Burke is currently Senior Public Policy Advisor at Baker Donaldson in Washington, D.C. In addition to her role at the firm, Sheila is a faculty member at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, a research fellow at Harvard's Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy, a research professor at the Public Policy Institute um, for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. She is also a member of the Institute of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Sheila Burke. Thank you very much, Dean Goldman. It is a, a great treat uh, for me to be here with all of you. My thanks to uh, President Knapp and to the faculty and all of you who are here today. Um, I have to say that I um, follow two people uh, that are difficult to follow. Uh, I have to acknowledge that they are both extraordinary public servants, uh, both Secretary Sebelius and Senator Daschle, both of whom I had the great privilege of working with. Uh, when I was on the Senate staff, have spent years uh, trying to solve many of the problems this nation faces, and I think for that we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. So um, my thanks to both of them, and uh, it is a privilege to follow them. Uh, I am going to, as is uh, often the case, um, talk a little bit about uh, some of what Senator Daschle has pointed out in terms of some of the challenges that are before us uh, as we look at the implementation of the legislation the barriers both uh, policy-wise as well as some of the politics. Uh, it is fair to say that after months of speculation, uh, including bets on whether or not broccoli uh, would be noted in the decision, uh, the court has indeed uh, concluded its business uh, and upheld almost all elements of the legislation, as the secretary pointed out. Uh, one might say they have crossed the Rubicon, much as Caesar did in 49 BC, uh, and it's now just a matter of moving forward. But, as has been the case since the initial passage of this particular piece of legislation, nothing is straightforward uh, about it or about its future. Uh, issues remain. They are complicated. Uh, the hurdles ahead are, in fact, both political and practical uh, and uh, really reflect many of the issues that Senator Daschle noted in terms of deep divisions uh, within the country about some fairly fundamental questions. Uh, the political hurdles include clearly efforts by the House Republicans in particular to repeal the legislation. Uh, clearly there is no chance uh, with respect to the Senate, uh, this Senate certainly, uh, but in the view of some it is a worthwhile effort to keep in front of the public the issues that underlie their opposition to the legislation uh, leading into the fall elections. Uh, and it is, in fact, a window into a very fundamental difference, uh, which, again, Senator Dasha pointed to that, and that is really the question of the role of government, uh, both the state government and the federal government with respect to the provision of health services, the financing and delivery of services in this country. Uh, specific elements of the legislation from the political standpoint could well become uh, part of a debate going forward with respect to the budget, uh, as we head towards discussions over the deficit, uh, over efforts to avoid a budget crisis once again, which will come towards the latter part of the year. Uh, once again, we face the prospects of a debt limit uh, and a debate over the debt limit, efforts to prevent the budget sequester from taking place that is scheduled to occur in January, uh, and a desire to reform the way we pay physicians, something known as the doc fix which has a price tag of somewhere in excess of $300 billion. All of those things are scheduled to occur in about a two to three month period towards the end of the year. Uh, you can obviously imagine that an interest in reforming the tax code, uh, questions of the extension are all or part of the so-called Bush tax cuts. All of those things are likely to play into uh, the opportunity and the desire on the part of some to essentially put forward some of the issues that are again contained in the underlying legislation and essentially put forward opportunities for reductions uh, in some of the programs that are embedded in the ACA uh, that in fact have price tags associated with them. Uh, one can imagine efforts to remove or reduce the spending on such things as the 
subsidies, both for individuals uh, as well as for um, tax credits uh, for drug subsidies. Uh, the IPAD that Senator Daschle described and mentioned uh, is an area of a particular attention on the part of some and a desire to essentially remove that mechanism uh, which is outside of the congressional authority with respect to the reduction in spending in a number of these programs, um, and using what is known as the reconciliation process, a unique congressional tool that requires only 51 votes and cannot, in fact, be filibustered. Uh, so that tool, which is unique, uh, could, in fact, provide an opportunity to address many of the underlying issues in the legislation so that even if repeal efforts are essentially not successful, you can imagine that people might well use those opportunities in those budget discussions to go after unique elements and, in doing so, try to prevent the implementation of elements of the bill. Uh, there's also, obviously, the possibility of new litigation. Uh, the Affordable Care Act amended a number of statutes uh, that are subject to discussion, including ERISA, the Public Health Service Act, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act, as well as uh, a number of the Medicare and Medicaid provisions. Uh, and you can imagine that efforts to enforce some of those provisions might well be subject to legislation and litigation going forward. Uh, you can imagine employers, plan sponsors, and others, for example, who may well challenge some of the underlying provisions in the bill. The call for repeal and replacement uh, could take many forms. Uh, and a number of individual legislative efforts and are likely to occur over the months and, in fact, years to come. As Senator Daschle suggested, this is something that will go for some lengthy period of time, is not likely to be resolved in the short term. Uh, what is interesting, of course, is many of the elements in the legislation, and this has been pointed out, were, in fact, elements of common ground. Many of the insurance provisions, for example, some of the underlying insurance reforms, were pieces of legislation that had been supported by Democrats and Republicans in the past. So one might imagine if a repeal and replace effort is put forward, there would be some of those elements that might well come back again uh, in another form. And of course, we've had the issues that have arisen at the state level. Uh, at its heart, much of what has to occur and the implementation of this legislation is, in fact, dependent upon the states and the state's response. Uh, Medicaid is cer certainly one of those issues and one of the most extraordinary ones in terms of the breadth and depth of coverage uh, that is offered. Uh, but there are others, certainly the exchanges and the operation of the exchanges going forward. The desire is, in fact, to have the states take up that mantle rather than simply leaving it to the federal government. Rate review, insurance regulation, all of those things, in fact, are dependent upon the states. So the, the movement really now is back to the states in terms of the detail. And the political dynamics at the state are as complicated as they are at the federal level and as fraught with uncertainty uh, as they are at the federal level in terms of going forward. You have governors who may well, in fact, uh, has been pointed out, uh, wait for the results of the November election before deciding what to do and how to proceed. You have state legislators in those same states who may well be at odds with their governors, but who may not well, in fact, be in session uh, at the moment and have to wait to come back into session to address what they think are opportunities presented to the states that the governors may, in fact, have declined. Uh, you have uh, budget issues that are as complicated at the state level. Many of them, of course, in the same kind of uh, difficulty the federal government is with respect to uh, their spending, but many of them also live under constitutional requirements to balance their budget. So a unique set of challenges for the states in terms of figuring out how to proceed. And you have a great deal of uncertainty. While the administration has been extraordinarily prolific in putting forward a number of regulations, there are still an enormous number of issues yet to be decided and upon which the states are depending guidance in terms of moving forward. Uh, some have begun planning. Uh, others have, in fact, waited for the court and are now scrambling to catch up. But regardless of the political challenges that are taking place at both the federal and the state level, there is no question that sweeping policy changes are underway. Uh, Senator Daschle, uh, in his remarks, made the case for why many of those changes are taking place and why they are likely to go forward irrespective of what occurs with respect to the legislation. Uh, obviously, it is touching one of the fastest growing elements of our economy, one that touches everyone from cradle to grave. 
uh, in terms of their everyday lives. There is no question that the way we deliver services, the way we finance services, how we train the professionals who in fact are going to provide those services are going to change. Profound change in how we look at those things and fundamental differences in how we ought to approach them going forward. No one disagrees, as Senator Dasho pointed out, about the need to rethink the way we do things and to move towards quality, to move towards affordable health care, uh, and at a price that doesn't simply shift the burden from the public sector to the private sector. So it's not simply ceasing payments for Medicare and Medicaid and expecting the private sector to pick it up. Nobody disagrees that that is, in fact, our goal and the direction we want to go. It means real change. Uh, elements uh, of the ACA, in fact, move us in this direction in a number of ways. But again, regardless of what happens with the underlying legislation, I think we will continue to see that push going forward and that push on both, again, the private side and the public side. Now, with respect to some of the practical questions, the implementation has, in fact, been shifted to the states in many respects. Uh, shortly after passage of uh, the legislation initially, the National Academy of uh, State Health Policy broke down into pieces all of the things that the state had to do and identified 109 milestones that the states would have to essentially meet. We know that in less than five months, the states have to inform CMS as to whether they're going to establish and be ready with respect to their exchanges. We know along with choosing their benchmark plan, they have to put in place the underlying fabric that would allow them to go forward. And of course, there is the question of Medicaid uh, and its expansion. Uh, so far, we have heard the following reactions from the states. First, let's move ahead. Secondly, let's not move ahead. Let's wait, do more analysis. We have budget concerns. Third, we're waiting for the elections. Fourth, we want flexibility. So that you have the full array of responses from the states which give you an indication that the solutions and the answers and the responses will in fact be 50 different answers, which of course is one of the challenges that we faced in the fact with respect to the Medicaid program and one we're likely to face going forward in terms of trying to solve some of these questions in a state-by-state -state way. So the issues going forward in terms of the practical side and implementation, uh, will the states be ready in 2014 if, in fact, the legislation goes forward, or will an extension be necessary? Does, in fact, the secretary have the authority to essentially extend some of those deadlines? Some would argue, no, that it has to be statutory, which mean the Congress would have to act once again. Although the Secretary and the Department are making every effort to provide flexibility, that fundamental question about the date line that is required will come into play. Will the states accept the enhanced match for Medicaid and expand? Uh, both Secretary Sebelius and Senator Daschle have indicated that in the past, history would suggest in the case of the original passage of Medicaid in 65, the changes that were made with respect to the CHIP program, that the states ultimately come on board. I don't think we can naturally assume that what has gone before will go forward again. Uh, the situations in the past were somewhat different. The financial status and standing in the states were somewhat different. They were, in many cases, less challenged than they are today. So I think we can't assume that they will as quickly sign on. And they, frankly, I think, have some concern. While there is a commitment of 100 percent matching uh, for two years with a phase down to 90 percent, there is some anxiety on the part of the states that the federal government has a tendency to change its view. And we've seen that occur. And when you hear discussions about block grants, for example, with respect to the Medicaid program, which are part of the budget discussion, there is some concern that they will, in fact, accept, commit, expectation of 100 percent matching money, only to be told some period down the road that, in fact, that won't be the case, and they will have to take on a greater burden. So that uncertainty and anxiety has led a number of the states to essentially step back. But they are, in fact, varied in their response, as we've heard in terms of press releases. There are a limited number that have said absolutely not. Uh, there are others who have been more contemplative and suggest that they're going to examine the question. And this is true of both Democrats and Republicans. Third, what options will exist uh, for the uninsured adults, in fact, in those states who do not choose to expand Medicaid? What can be made available to them? 
Uh, we know, for example, that the secretaries made efforts to uh, indicate that they will not be penalized for a failure to essentially be insured, uh, the very low income. But we also know that the law prohibits subsidies for very low income individuals. Uh, as it currently exists. So the question is, what options do the states have available to them? What options are they likely to choose? Is it under a waiver status or some other solution? If, in fact, they end up in a situation where those individuals who would have been eligible, the singles and childless couples under the Medicaid program, are not eligible in certain states, what alternatives are available and how best to address that? To what extent will employers be required or essentially try to really align their workforce to meet the requirements that are going to be imposed on them. Uh, given the requirement to provide full coverage uh, to full-time employees uh, and the definition of full-time employee at 30, query whether some of those employers will restructure their workforce so they don't hit that number. So they are essentially exempt from the provisions and what that would mean for the workforce and what that would mean going forward in terms of those populations. That is a small number uh, of the very large number of questions that are yet to be asked uh, and yet to be addressed that have to be addressed going forward. So while there clearly is momentum going forward, I think there is still a great deal of uncertainty and a great many questions that are both political in nature as well as policy in nature uh, that essentially are yet to be answered to give us some conclusion as to how we are going to go forward. I think the Secretary and the Department deserve a lot of credit. Uh, they have, in fact, reached out to the states. They are indicating that they are going to be as flexible as they possibly can be within the constraints provided by the law to try and give the states the opportunity to move forward. But again, as is often the case, uh, time will, in fact, tell and how the governors will respond, how their legislators will respond. And as Senator Daschle correctly pointed out, in fact, elections matter. Uh, and what occurs in November will make an enormous difference potentially uh, in any number of combinations, whether the Senate stays Democrat, whether the House remains Republican, whether you have a transition in the Senate, a narrowing of the margins, whether the White House changes hands. Any one of those things could alter the, in, in fact, shift the balance of power in terms of how these things are going to be addressed. And finally, I'll go back to my opening remarks and my question, yes, Broccoli was, in fact, mentioned in the decision. It was mentioned 12 times. It was mentioned by Justice Roberts, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Scalia. Thank you very much. Okay, second. Um, I just want to thank uh, Sheila Burke for those um, wonderful words and those important questions. And, also for indirectly reminding all of us to eat our broccoli, so that's, it is important, actually. But I would now like to turn our program over to Professor Sarah Rosenbaum. Professor Rosenbaum, as many of you know, is the Harold and Jane Hirsch Professor of Health Law and Policy and founding chair of the Department of Health Policy at the George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services. She also holds secondary appointments in the George Washington Law School and the School of Medicine and Health Sciences. A graduate of Wesleyan University and Boston University Law School, Professor Rosenbaum has devoted her professional career to issues of health justice for populations who are medically underserved as a result of race, poverty, or disability, or cultural exclusion. An honored teacher and scholar, a highly popular speaker, and a widely read health law and policy scholar, Professor Rosenbaum has emphasized public engagement as a core element of her professional life and has served six presidential administrations and 15 Congresses. Professor Rosenbaum is best known for her tireless efforts to expand coverage of Medicaid and to promote community health centers, patients' rights in managed care, civil rights in health care, and national health reform. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rosenbaum and our panel. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to the audience uh, at all the schools of public health around the country who are listening in. Uh, as you can tell from your programs, those of you who are sitting here and have programs, um, this is an exceptional panel. 
I'm going to give them very brief introductions. In fact, um, I assume that uh, they are known to you. Uh, and the purpose of this panel is actually to serve as a resource both to you in this room and also to uh, the audiences who are listening in around the country. My colleague, Paula Lance, who is the chair of our Department of Health Policy, uh, is going to be fielding the questions that are coming in from the virtual audience along with Professor Marsha Regenstein from the department. And um, we will be taking questions here as well. And what I'm going to do is treat this, as I've told everybody, essentially a lightning round. I'm going to give them a quick introduction uh, and then move into some quick questions just, just to get the ball, the ball rolling. Sheila gets to sit here and wait until we open it up. You don't have to answer a lightning round question. You, you've already qualified for the finals. Um, so uh, let me just quickly introduce everybody who's up here, um, get us off with the fast question, and then hopefully we'll have a good 20, you know, 20 minutes or so for, for Q&A. George's Benjamin, at the end, uh, has been the executive director of the American Public Health Association since 2002, served before that as secretary of the Maryland Department of Mental Hygiene, and has dedicated his career to the service of public health. Uh, Melinda Hatton, Mindy Hatton, uh, is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the American Hospital Association, where she provides leadership on all aspects of uh, legal ad advocacy and legal matters for the AHA. Karen Ignani is President and CEO of America's Health Insurance Plans, where she represents uh, members providing uh, health insurance, long-term care, dental and disability benefits to more than 200 million Americans. Ron Pollock is founding executive director of Families USA, uh, the national organization for healthcare consumers, uh, and was former dean of the Antioch School of Law. And finally, Sonia Schwartz uh, directs the State Reform Project for the National Academy for State Health Policy. Uh, the reform is a wonderful resource for information on state implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So with that, um, we are now into lightning round, and I'm going to start with George's. So the question for you is a simple one, which is what does the Affordable Care Act mean if you are a public health practitioner? Well, you know, um, as, as a physician, i got to tell you, the fundamental question for us is does, does coverage matter? Um, and the answer is unequivocally, absolutely. And we know that 44,000 people die prematurely simply because they do not have health insurance. Uh, we know that delayed care often translates medically into no care. Um, so from a public health perspective, both individually and from populations, this will make a major difference. Terrific. Karen, the ACA is vast. It affects multiple insurance markets, uh, creates new markets. I'm wondering if you can just quickly tick off some of the big issues that the insurance industry is focusing on in implementation. The, the large uh, question is workability, and um, that is going to be contingent upon affordability. So for the promise of the legislation to be fulfilled, it's going to be very important that people actually purchase insurance. And that's going to be dependent on how all of the provisions interact. And we've been zeroing in on now that there's time between now and January 1, 2014, on all these different interactions. There are ta new taxes in the bill, premium taxes that will increase the cost of coverage. There are provisions in the bill that will transition overnight that will increase the cost of coverage. And largely, people are buying catastrophic now, and they'll have to buy up to a broader set of benefits. There's time, we think, to think about how do these interactions occur. There probably wasn't time to really think about those in the context of creating all the legislative provisions, and that's what we're going to be focused on. How do they all interact, and how can you make sure that people find the purchase of coverage affordable? Great. Ron, other than the seminal part of the decision upholding the act in its entirety, probably the biggest focus was on Medicaid. I don't need to say probably, I think Medicaid has definitely turned out to be sort of the great sleeper issue in all of this. Can you explain just in a nutshell, um, uh, elaborate a little bit about on what the Secretary said, what the court exactly did on Medicaid, where do we stand now? Well, the Affordable Care Act provides a very large carrot and a significant stick to get states to expand health coverage to 133% of poverty. The carrot, as the Secretary said, 
provides unprecedented federal matching dollars, 100% in the first three years, 2014 to 2016, and then it ratchets down but never goes down below 90%. So this is a huge benefit to the states. The stick was that the legislation allowed, didn't require, but allowed the secretary to withhold existing Medicaid funds to the states if they refused to expand coverage. The Supreme Court withdrew that stick. The carrot remains, and in fact, all of the Medicaid statute remains. So now the question is, will states, which have voluntarily uh, implemented the Medicaid program with a, a match of about 56, 57 percent, and the, chips prog the CHIP program at about 75 percent, and every one of the states implemented those programs. Will they now adopt this expansion that provides federal dollars 90 to 100 percent? And one last thing I would say, Sarah, and that is how important this is. You know, for parents, the median income eligibility standard among the 50 states is not 100 percent of poverty. It's 62 percent of poverty. That means for a family of three, if you've got income above $12,000 a year, you're ineligible for Medicaid. In some states, like Pennsylvania, if you have income above $6,800, you're ineligible. And in 42 states, if you are a childless adult, single or a childless couple, you're ineligible for Medicaid coverage even if you are literally penniless. So this expansion is important. I think the inducement which remains will have the states expand. And, and Mindy, this brings me to you. You're, you're here essentially waving, carrying the banner for health, the health healthcare providers generally. And uh, it, it's sort of an amazing time because hospitals, specifically hospitals, of course, are dealing with both uh, what will hopefully be a, a broad growth in the number and proportion of the population with insurance, but at the same time, you are also um, dealing with issues that but we're already in motion at the time the law was passed and sort of speeded up uh, as a result of the law, larger issues of, of health system transformation. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you see as hospitals' great challenges now lying ahead. Thanks, Sarah. Well, of course, the Supreme Court's decision on Medicaid added to our challenges in a, in a fairly unexpected way. Um, but even before that, the Health Care Act really threw down the gauntlet for the hospital field to really change the way health care is delivered, to fundamentally restructure a siloed system that was working well for very few people into a continuum of care where that focused on patients, that focused on quality, that was able to provide the services um, from, the, from the, the moment the patient walked into the door until they were well um, in a way that we just haven't been able to before. The secretary mentioned some of the programs. There are a great number of delivery system reforms that were preserved by the Supreme Court's decision that hospitals will hospitals have embraced but also will be a challenge to implement. And, and uh, whether it's a, an affordable care, you know, the, the ACO program that she mentioned, um, dealing with uh, improving the quality through improved um, performance on hospital infections, or whether it's readmission programs, there are an enormous number of challenges in this act. And it will really take hospitals working with other providers and working with other insurers to, um, to come up with the leadership and the programs to, to make the changes that the Affordable Care Act has really, um, has really put in place. Thanks. And Sonia, last to you. Um, can you talk a little bit just, it's, it's, it, you know, the Affordable Care Act really is a state-driven law. Uh, the federal government is sort of at the helm trying to steer in some ways, but this all rests with the states to make it work. And I wonder if you could talk just quickly about some of the big challenges. Sure. Um, when you asked this question, it reminded me, um, we held our annual conference with state officials who run programs like Medicaid, who are building the state health insurance exchanges. And just a few months after the law passed in 2010, they came to the meeting with these buttons that said, 2014 is today. And at the time, we kind of laughed about it, but I think they were trying to set a tone for their staff and for their agencies about how much work they were going to have to get done in time, even with three and four years lead time. You know, with the Supreme Court decision behind us, we're now at about 18 months from January 1st, 2014. And 
actually, we have a pretty ambitious agenda for states that want to move forward. We have really 109 steps we've defined. I'm going to just talk about three things that really help um, are really focused on what I think is the centerpiece of the Affordable Care Act, which is you know helping all the uninsured access coverage. The first one relates to state insurance markets. I think you heard the secretary talk about you know, eliminating pre-existing conditions and making sure that those who need coverage can actually get into the system. Um, the, the law was modeled after a very small set of states like New York and New Jersey that already provided some of those insurance reforms. Um, the vast majority of states have a lot of work to do to align those reforms. They need to figure out what to do with their individual and small group markets. Do they merge them? Do they keep them separate? How do they, um, how do they attract the young and healthy? There is a mandate, but they need to do more to make sure young and healthy get into the pool so that the costs don't go up. They also are going to be dealing with, in some cases, thousands, in some cases, millions of people who've been uninsured and don't know a lot about private health insurance. They need to educate them about their rights. Some of these people are going to have issues that need to be worked out, and they need to know where to go to get help. Um, the second one um, is one that I don't think we've talked too much about, which is enrolling the uninsured. I know it's a project Families USA has. Um, states really where take the lead in, in the enrollment of the uninsured, both in Medicaid and in the exchange. Um, you know, California is expecting millions to come knocking on the door. Rhode Island's expecting thousands, but really a lot of the same steps need to get done. Their, their challenge is to create these online marketplaces where people can shop for insurance in the exchange or portals where they can enter Medicaid. Not everyone can come in online, so they also have to have backup systems so that people can come in by phone or in person to get assistance. Um, and that's, there's a lot of work to be done there. And the last one has to do with benefit design. Um, so... Some states, you know, are moving along with Medicaid and need to be thinking about choosing benchmark plan options for that expansion population. In the exchange, there's another decision related to essential health benefits and the benchmark plan there. These benchmark plans are kind of like model plans that states have a, cho a choice within they can make, and they're working on that now. It's actually a pretty high-stakes decision. The benefit plan is really where... Um, the, the access, the financing, the, the key to kind of accessing the services and providers that people need is. And, you know, there have been battles fought at state houses over the last decades to, you know, add certain benefits to the individual market or the small group market, and they don't want to refight those battles mm -hmm. today, but states have a lot of ba a balancing act, really, between the access to care people need and the cost of adding benefits to, to programs and plans. So those are some of the key things. I think um, the last thing I was going to say is, you know, I get a chance to ask states a lot, what do you guys need? You know, there's a lot on your plates, um, and I think there's a lot of you know, the press, is, the press accounts kind of create a polarizing kind of map of what states are doing. In our data and from the conversations we have, we, this is sort of how we see it. We see about a dozen states that are really active, really enthusiastic moving forward. I think the secretary mentioned a letter from a dozen governors. We see about 12 states that are pre opposed politically, you know, slowing down, not doing much. And then really the vast majority of states left over that aren't in those two camps are in the middle and they're trying to solve some of the problems I talked about and figure out how to do this in a way that meets kind of their state values and cultures. So Great. that's what I'd say. Thank you very much. So the actual and virtual floor is open. Um, a favor because we have people, again, listening from around the country and not that long to um, get through questions and answers. If you're going to ask a question, keep it short. We're going to try and keep our answers short uh, so that we can get in as many questions and answers as possible. Paula, do you want to start with, with a question from the virtual audience? Sure. Um, so the question is, the ACA is primarily about coverage. How will it actually increase utilization of health care? And a related question is, how does the ACA help to fix the primary care provider shortage so that covered individuals actually have access to providers? Who wants to start? Well, I can start. I mean, Great. it does several things. Number one, it enhances reimbursement for primary care providers. It has some low repayment and scholarship programs to try to help build the primary care um, physician, nursing, um, nurse practitioner, uh, and other allied health professional network. Um, it has funding to build community health centers um, and help them modernize some of their operations. Um, and it has a lot of things like the health information technology work to help us work smarter and um, not as hard. If I could add to that, yeah. one of the other interesting um, questions is, in fact, what that provider mix is going to look like going forward yeah. and a clear sense that we need, in addition to physicians and a greater number of primary care physicians, that we need to look at the workforce in its entirety. And so the investments in the development of nurse practitioner programs, 
uh, the ladders that allow nurses that are in practice to transition through, the consideration of what a community health worker might look like, might do in terms of providing access to services. So it really is call, calling into question that fundamental issue as to whether or not we have the workforce necessary going forward to service people in the way they want to be cared for. And don't you think though, we have to begin to redefine the workforce in Absolutely. the sense of thinking more broadly? I think there's been a big barrier to your point uh, George is and Sheila, the, there's been a big bar barrier in scope of practice. Well, I think we're going to have to really right. rethink. I think that's where you were leading us, and I think that's right. exactly right. And for public health schools around the country who have been at the right. epicenter of this conversation, mm -hmm. this is a very important issue in terms of will we have the infrastructure that's necessary. And I think to the question, the virtual question about is there going to, will there be enough physicians, maybe we need to really begin to think about do the physicians need to do everything that they've always been doing, or how do we get other practitioners to work to the top of their licenses so that primary care physicians could work to the top of their licenses as well? Yeah. well we've, already, we've already seen battles in, in the states. The hospitals have right. seen battles right. in the states over scope of practice, right. and I think that's going to be. I mean, that's going to be an area where I know the Federal Trade Commission is very, um, very interested mm -hmm. and involved mm -hmm. in that. But we'll we'll need a lot of. I think. Um, care and scrutiny in that area. But that's another example of where it's really at the state level. Yeah. I mean, the fundamental questions of access, so. the fundamental questions of practice and scope of practice for non-physician providers, in fact, plays out at the state level and state legislatures. You know, one of the, one of the uh, personnel uh, issues that hasn't gotten much attention is dentists. And, yes, and, yes. Uh, the uh, essential health benefits which lists 10 different kinds of benefits, includes pediatric right. dental care. Yes. And we've got even a greater shortage mm. with respect to <laughs> dentists. Absolutely. And one of the issues that is pretty hotly debated in a lot of states is whether in those places where you have a real shortage, can you use dental therapists mm -hmm. uh, to provide care? This, there's a program that's pioneered, at least in the United States, yeah. uh, among Alaska yeah, Native Alaska villages, yes. and it works very well. And now there are about a half dozen states which are considering legislation to allow dental therapists to provide uh, care. Uh, I think it's going to be considerably more critical to allow an expansion like dental therapists if we're actually going to serve the children. Well, and I, I think it's worth pointing out because it's very easy to forget that the reason that we are now so... Uh, involved as we should be with these follow-on questions which come up for the new insurance design, comes up for hospitals, is because we are on the verge, hopefully, of insuring a lot of people. And these are the kinds of questions that, if, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you only get to ask, really, when you change the, the, the financing mechanism that underlies a society. And so I think that while the law has these two sides to it, you know, it, ha it has three sides, really. It has health care, it has health care finance, and it has, has public health. Um, that you can't ask the, the downstream questions of health care and system transformation if you don't do something about people's coverage. Another question. Yeah. Sarah, I'm going to be asking. Oh, you're, that's right. You're asking I have all, all the, the questions. <laughs> you're I have the magic the cards. Um, so without a significant Medicaid expansion, aren't we in danger of becoming a country with two tiers of states in terms of health care, those with almost universal coverage, like Massachusetts, and those with 25 to 30 percent who are uninsured? And what will be the implications of this? Well, you know, I want to just say that you know, we, we're, we've heard in the last few days a number of governors who said they're not going to implement the Medicaid expansion. And I guess if I had a message on that issue, I would say, you know, tune out for a little bit. Wait till after November. You know, we're still in election funny season, and uh, and <laughs> and you know, and and I think uh, those governors, typically Republican governors, some of them are, are are making their comments with an eye to 2016. They want to look holier than thou. I think the real question is what happens after November, if the president is reelected. And in quotes, Obamacare is going to be implemented. I think you're going to hear a different tune. Even the governor of Wisconsin on this one actually uh, held his commitment one way or another to this. Uh, any governor ultimately that rejects 100% funding for expansion of coverage is committing fiscal malpractice. And at the same time, not only are they leaving all this money on the table, but they have then state expenditures to 
pay for care that's being provided to people who are uninsured, whether through public hospitals or a variety of other programs. I think at the end of the day, uh, like the Secretary said, I think all of the states are going to pick this up. But obviously, if that does not happen, if I'm wrong about that, then we're going to have very different systems. I mean, Texas already, 25% uh, of that state's population is uninsured. Actually, it's 27% is uninsured. In Florida, it's 25%. So it would be extraordinary, and it would be very different than a state like Massachusetts. Sonia, did you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I did want to say, you know, so the Secretary, and I think Ron also mentioned the history we have with CHIP. Um, I just wanted to give you a little more context about sort of optional populations in Medicaid, optional benefits in Medicaid over the years, and what states have done. A couple examples are pregnant women. Um, in the federal Medicaid law, states have to cover pregnant women up to 133% of poverty and not above. Um, the vast majority of states, I think it's 43 or 44, are covering these women up to 185% of poverty. They're doing it with that sort of regular old federal match around 56% on average, not the 100% match. Um, states only have to cover certain benefits in Medicaid. If I'm right, I think they don't even have to cover prescription drugs. And they all do. Um, they go beyond. They cover more benefits than they need to. Um, they're just really, I could go on and on about um, the word optional, I know, was a surprise uh, after the Supreme Court decision, but I don't think it means that we're going to see the vast majority of states without Medicaid by 2014. I think that we'll see almost every state will, have, will provide Medicaid coverage. I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> we're ready. Okay, well, we have several questions about the precedence of the Supreme Court decision vis-a-vis -vis the Commerce Clause and the Spending Clause and what this might mean for areas other than health insurance, like environmental regulation or education or transportation or, dare we say, broccoli. You know, it's actually a very profound... I'm, uh, Absolutely. As, as you indicated, I used to be a law school dean. We, we, we usually... I had a sign behind my desk... It was a quotation from Chico Marx. Uh, if you got a problem, right. get a lawyer, then you got a bigger problem, but at least you got a lawyer. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that, uh, you know, the Commerce Clause issue is a very significant one. We've had, uh, we, we've had really a transition that occurred in 1937. In 19, uh, prior to 1937, the Supreme Court struck virtually all the uh, major laws that were being uh, uh, enacted, especially to try and deal with the recession. And we had this big political problem of President Roosevelt tried to pack the court. He was unsuccessful. But ironically, one of the justices switched his votes. Ironically, it was Justice Roberts. Um, so we've got uh, two Roberts who have actually uh, are... Uh, key points here in this process. So starting in 1937, uh, almost any legislation that had some reasonable relationship to commerce was viewed as being constitutional under the Commerce Clause. Here, even though the uh, Chief Justice tried to distinguish by saying, we're not really regulating commerce with the Affordable Care Act, we're forcing people into commerce, uh, by forcing them to buy a product they don't want to buy, uh, private insurance, I, I, I think it's a rather specious distinction because actually the commerce involves health care, and what the Congress was trying to regulate was how we pay for health care. But it might have a profound impact, and certainly the spending clause issue could be rather profound. You know, the Medicaid program has been in operation for 47 years. And there have been expansions for kids, for pregnant moms, for people with disabilities, and for seniors. And there has never been a court at any level, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, District Court, which invalidated any of those expansions. So we may see some change in doctrine that might have an impact in other areas. Absolutely. Mindy, did well, you want to jump in? Um, absolutely. I think I'm with Ruth Bader Ginsburg on this one, where she says she doesn't think the Commerce Clause decision will be long lived. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that she's right. Um, but I think one of the most significant things that the court did is when it ex accepted the coercion doctrine as a way to strike down the Medicaid penalty. Mm -hmm. That is really, I mean, that really was a, a hallmark mm -hmm. change in, um, and one that was, um, and one that had a vote of seven of the justices. So it's going to be around mm -hmm. for a while. And um, you can certainly see that the, the court has said, 
um, in their decision that 5% of your highway funds right. is okay. All of your Medicaid funds is not okay. I think there's going to be a lot of litigation, exactly. and not just around the Medicaid where's program, the, about the where, where's the sweet where's the spot here. And the next time, you know, <laughs> what the other thing, of course, that was very profound in the decision is the court said, with respect to the adult expansion, this is different in kind, not in degree. So what happens the next time Congress is considering an amendment to a federal education program, a federal social services program? When does something become different in kind and not degree? Uh, and that will be a huge area of debate. So I mean, the long and the short of it is that the legal ramifications from this decision um, have certainly in the regulatory sphere some spillover effect, but probably the biggest spillover effects I think will be in the spending area. So, Sarah, the concept that the yeah. court, that the Chief Justice was trying to push is that you've got two sovereigns here. Mm -hmm. You've got the federal government, which is sovereign, and the state, which is sovereign. Mm -hmm. And this sovereign cannot coerce, cannot Absolutely. force a state to, to do something mm -hmm. against its independent judgment. And so then the question is, you know, obviously in a lot of programs there's an inducement provided right. to get a state to do something. When does an inducement become, become coercion? Undue influence. And there'll be a lot a gun, of litigation. A gun to the head. A gun to the head. <laughs> there were there were more there, there were more metaphors, <laughs> you know, and visual <laughs> images in the decision. Let's see if we have maybe one last non legal non lawyery question. <laughs> How about a public health question? Um, so what does the Supreme Court decision mean for the prevention fund? And then related to that, what can be done to make prevention a, a, a better sell on the Hill and beyond? Good. Well, you know, I, I guess that one's for me. So, um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, you know we, were, I, we were actually at the APHA mid-year meeting when this, uh, reading the SCOTUS blog, and we all jumped up and cheered. And I, I think one of the things we understood was that um, – from our, from our perspective, this means that the prevention fund is constitutional. Um, and we think it gives us an opportunity to say that loudly um, and try to get many of the people that have been uh, opponents of the prevention fund to back off. Um, I, I think the, the, the fact is around prevention, in fact, around this whole piece of legislation, um, if, if you're in a state that doesn't want to implement this thing, um, you're going to have to ask your business community. They really want to be in, you know, put a business in a community that's not thinking about prevention in a community that's not going to have a lot of sick people in a community that's, that um, has high uninsurance rates. Um, so I think that at the end of the day, when the academic health centers um, and the business community um, and the citizens begin to understand this, um, there's going to be an uprising um, that um, you've not seen before. And when people really understand what the implications are in terms of death, disability, and opportunity, um, uh, it may take some time, but I think every single state will be on board. Uh, and I think there will be a, a, a huge cry for us to move more towards this idea of fixing things before they, they happen, so moving from the, um, a sick care system to a well care system. I know Karen and Sheila have observations, and then I think I'm going to close this out. I think there's um, a great deal of excitement going on in the on the benefit side with oh, respect yes, yes. to prevention and thinking about the importance of the individual in this whole equation. We always have healthcare policy discussions and we leave out the consumer, leave out the individual. And now there's been real efforts to redesign benefit packages so that people who have chronic illnesses get the drugs they need with it very little um, out-of-pocket costs to make sure that they're able to maintain their health and there's a great deal of thinking about that and we're beginning to see real results that are material. I think more broadly as people think about how to deal with the 20 percent of people that are consuming 80 percent of the resources, this concept of prevention and how we think about it, how we leverage that chronic illness, care coordination, it all goes together. I think we're at the front of this, not the back end of that, so I think there's a lot of great um, opportunity to make some significant progress that will mean better health care for people. And I think in the end, that's what all of us want to see, I think. Sheila, you've got the last word. Mm -hmm. uh, so rarely the case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't disagree with Karen nor with George's in terms of the importance of prevention or the attention to prevention, but I think in this case, in the context of the ACA, there are provisions that are a part of the essential health benefits uh, that will become reality as a result of the um, 
uh, the coverage. But I think we cannot underestimate the extraordinary pressure on the federal budget on domestic discretionary spending. Uh, and I think while there will be a major push in these areas and an argument to be made, and I think you're right that the academic medical centers, insurers, and others will certainly make the case for the importance of prevention and the importance of that uh, essentially investment very early on. We know with children in particular, uh, there's an extraordinary return on a dollar invested in preventive care in terms of their long-term health. But I think we cannot underestimate what's going to be on the table in terms of the budget, in terms of the sequester discussions, in terms of the debt limit uh, as we go forward around anything that is not an entitlement program, anything that is not, in fact, statutorily required to be spent. So anything that is discretionary in nature, I think you have to assume is going to be at risk. And in fact, that has occurred over the last few years as a greater percentage of the budget has been consumed by the entitlements. There's been tremendous pressure on the discretionary programs. And the prevention fund, of course, was put up uh, as one opportunity in terms of finding funds. So I think we cannot uh, ignore the potential for that to be at risk in these discussions going forward. I wasn't actually talking about the prevention no, fund. No, I know you weren't. Because I, I think exactly. that quite a, a lot of what's going on is quite independent of exactly. all that. So that exactly. gives people a little hope anyway that you right. know, there are some real things going on. I think on. that's right. But I think the states, if they're depending on some of that federal money, will be at risk. But right. I think the yeah. private side right. will be a real and opportunity. And we're going to have to do a better... Um, we're going to do a better job making an economic argument to offset those, right. those arguments. Exactly. And I think it also drives home the point that health reform hardly stopped when right. we passed the Affordable Care Act, that we will be watching the Act's implementation and the waves of the Act and the waves of the decision uh, through the election, the end of this year, and, and then some. So thank you, everybody, very much. <laughs>